welcome at this. Uh, it's the sixth already Instruct Eric uh, webinar uh, from a rainy Brussels. Um, I will start with, with two introductory slides on Instruct and you will immediately understand why I do this. Instruct Eric, as you know, is uh, the European research infrastructure uh, for structural biology, and then we essentially uh, provide access to 15 uh, member states or the scientists of 15 member states at least uh, to top notch uh, infrastructure in structural biology. So far, uh, we provided access to, to 10 centers and 23 facilities spread over Europe, and then the red, the, the red dutches in fact indicate where they are located but in fact since today we are not 10 but we are 11 uh, centers and it's my honor and my pleasure uh, to be able to announce that just today in fact uh, 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 EMBL uh, started to also uh, be uh, an instruct center and, and, and they will provide access to crystallization uh, facilities uh, to molecular biophysics and, and also to EM. So uh, I really want to uh, give uh, the people from e EMBL a, a warm uh, welcome to our community. And, and I'm sure this is a major step forward uh, for providing uh, all scientists uh, uh, throughout uh, Europe access to uh, high level in infrastructure in structural biology. I'm Jan Steyalt from Brussels. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm representing uh, the Instruct Center uh, from Belgium. And we have uh, two infrastructures in Belgium that uh, produce services for, for the European community. First of all, there is nanobodies uh, for Instruct. That's in fact, uh, the infrastructure that I'm running, uh, but I will not talk about nanobodies today. I mean, uh, we are already around for many years and most people know what we are doing. So I will give the floor to Han to, to bring a fascinating scientific story. And we also have uh, a new facility in, in, in Belgium that provides services to instruct now, and that's called Robotein. Uh, and they offer, in fact, automated screenings uh, for uh, recombinant protein expression, purification, and then formulation. And André Matagne will, in fact, be the second speaker, and he will uh, introduce you to the services that are provided uh, by his center. So the first speaker will be Han Reymout. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to, in fact, uh, put a whole CV in a single slide, but he uh, made his PhD in Ghent, uh, did a postdoc in, in the Waxman lab in, in London, and is currently co-director of our Center for Structural Biology in Brussels. And, and he will bring a fascinating story uh, describing where very basic uh, research, fundamental research uh, on, on bacterial amyloids, in fact, not only provides uh, fascinating stories, uh, relating to, to secretion of proteins uh, and uh, the production of, of, of polymers uh, by bacteria, but uh, he will also uh, give you insights in, in the applications uh, that he uh, developed based on, 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 these, uh, on these findings. And, and second speaker is André Montagne. Uh, he made his PhD also in Belgium at the University of Liège, did a postdoc in, 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 in Dobson's lab, uh, who fortunately died last year, I think, uh, at Oxford. Uh, he's currently the director of the Center of Protein Engineering at the University of Liège, and, and he will essentially describe the different technologies that are provided through uh, the new facility. Uh, in Liège. So I give the floor to Han now. Um, maybe just uh, give you all uh, the advice that if you have questions, just drop them in the Q&A box uh, 
uh, down on your screen and uh, from there we will pick them up after each uh, presentation. Han, the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay, thank you Jan for uh, the introduction and, and also thank you for the opportunity to give this Instruct uh, webinar. I'd like to start the webinar with, uh, with, with congratulating the Instruct Direct Director, David Stewart, uh, who was recently honored uh, knighthood by, uh, by the Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom in the 2021 New Year's uh, honors. This is really honoring his, his many uh, efforts that he has done for, for European structural biology and, and UK structural biology. Um, so congratulations, David, and thank you for all your efforts uh, that you're doing. Before Christmas, um, there was a lot of uncertainty on the Instruct Eric because of Brexit, uh, but good thing we have a Brexit deal, and even better that we now have a knight, a British knight, who's leading the Instruct Eric. So, so congratulations and, and thank you for all your efforts. Um, today, as Jan uh, said, I'll be talking about curly, uh, a functional amyloid found in, in bacteria. Let me start first with, with a brief introduction in what we do in, in the lab in, in Brussels. We look at bacterial cell surfaces, and we're mostly interested in looking at these surfaces because they're the contact zone uh, of bacteria with, with, with eukaryotic hosts. So we mostly look at it, or, or one aspect of what we do is looking at it in the, in the context of Post pathogen interactions. And then we're interested in understanding these, these different pathways that are there to, to, um, and to secrete these proteins and assemble these proteins on the surface of the bacteria and in the recognition process that bacteria have with their, with their hosts. We're interested in that because of fundamental aspects of how these pathways uh, work. We were also interested uh, in that because these pathways open up routes for, for, in, uh, intervening in these processes. So we, we, we think we can have novel uh, antibiotics or antibacterials coming out of this. And also something that we see more and is getting more attention in my lab is that by looking at these pathways, we're inspired uh, to use these pathways as novel biomaterials or in biotech applications. And, and I'll, I'll talk about part of that at the end of, of this uh, webinar. So today I'll be talking about Curly, which is a, a big, uh, one of the big projects in, in the lab. So uh, Curly are these protein fibers that you find on, as part of the extracellular matrix in many gram-negative bacteria. They're formed or they're found in the context of biofilms, so these multicellular communities of these bacteria, and you can see the fibers here, so the major uh, pro component and mostly ma certainly major protein component in this extracellular matrix that is holding the cells together uh, are these curly. What is remarkable of these curly is that uh, now 20 years ago it was shown that they are adopting the amyloid fold. Uh, what is even more remarkable is that that amyloid fold is their native state. So these are functional amyloids, meaning that the amyloid formation is part of a biosynthetic pathway, which is very different to what was known and or what was mostly assumed that amyloids were, were protein misfolding disorders. And of course, there are many protein misfolding disorders and, and these amyloids are, or the amyloid formation at least, is associated with cytotoxicity. So it, it was revealing uh, that there are pathways that have the amyloid states as their native state. And Curly is one of the major ones, but, but not the only one and, and new ones are being discovered in bacteria, but, but also other domains uh, of life. And so they're, they're important for holding cells together in biofilms, and they're important for attaching the bacteria in these biofilms to, to non-biotic surfaces uh, as well. So, I mean, for us, what, what, what initially drew me into looking into the curly pathway is, is, is this protein here and it's accessory protein. So it's, I mean, this is gram-negative bacteria. We have two membranes and then the space in between is called periplasmic uh, space. This protein here called CSDG, this is an outer membrane channel or, or transport molecule, which is responsible for translocating the subunits to the cell surface from, from, from the periplasm. And it does so in conjunction with two partner proteins, one periplasmic CSGE, and an extracellular one, CSGF. And what's remarkable is that this transport process uh, is done at the outer membrane, where, which is a semi-porous membrane, so you have no proton motive force, 
you also have no access to ATP, which is in, in the cytoplasm, but you have no access to these cellular energy sources at the outer membrane. So, so that brings a big conundrum is how does the system and how does these transport protein, how can it translocate uh, protein subunits across the biological bilayer? What's also of interest to us is how does it coordinate secretion with assembly of a fiber on the surface? So these are topics that are driving us in what we're doing in the lab. And then more recently, we're also interested in looking into what about amyloid toxicity? If, if there are, I mean, we know of so many pathological amyloids where the amyloid state, or at least the process of forming the amyloid intermediates towards the amyloid state are cytotoxic. I mean, is this a, are there generic aspects of the structure or the, or the aggregation pathway that are leading to cytotoxicity? Is there an adaptation in this evolved amyloid uh, that, that can either avoid the buildup of these toxic species or at least deal with them uh, during the amyloid uh, assembly? So in, in the webinar today, I will mostly talk about our recent efforts to, to do, I mean, to structural studies in the amyloid fiber and the curly fiber itself, and then the, the, the uh, amyloid aggregation pathway to, to help address or, or ask questions about amyloid toxicity. And then I'll very briefly touch upon um, the channel itself and expand a little bit more on application of the channel in, in nanopore sensing applications and, and, and devices. So first, uh, a bit of an introductory and, and, and maybe for many people, uh, a reminder of, of what amyloids are. And this is coming from a great review from Chitty and, uh, and, and Chris Dobson. Um, so this is, I mean, just as a probably reminder for everybody, amyloid fibers are cross beta stacked fibers, really robust fibers, and they're associated with, with inflammation and, and maybe toxicity. In the pathological amyloids, certainly mostly, I mean, they can come from folded proteins. So the native state are folded proteins or also some IDPs, intrinsically disordered proteins. Then because of environmental factors, these are destabilized uh, or are fragmented. Uh, so local unfolding or fragmentation, and this then can lead to aggregation. And from aggregation, uh, the systems uh, can find a, a, a second stable uh, conformation, which is this cross beta strand uh, stacking. And then you have nucleation events. And once there is nuclei, this serves as a template for the recruitment of new monomers, uh, amyloidogenic monomers, and this second step is usually faster than the, than the primary nucleation step uh, itself. So what about, what, what about Curly? Uh, so first of all, an introduction into the subunits that are responsible, uh, that, that forming the fibers. And these are two subunits in the systems called CSGA and CSGP. CSDA is the major subunit, so this is the dominant species that you find inside the fibers, and B is there as a minor component uh, of the fibers. So this is an E. coli cell where you can see the curly on, on the surface. Most of these are formed by CSGA. Uh, B is a minor component, but B in the biological system is required as a nucleator. So if you, if you remove B from, from the genome, uh, these bacteria will result in secreting, releasing unfolded CSGA into the environment, but you will not find surface uh, localized fibers in, in these uh, systems. So this is the biological system. We can also replicate this in vitro, so we can start from purified CSGA uh, under denatured conditions, so having a chiotrope. We then we can dissolve so that I mean, we, we end up with unfolded CGA, which then in a matter of minutes and hours will uh, spontaneously self-assemble into these fibers, which I mean, as far as we can say, are isomorphous with the fibers that you find on the biological surface or on in, in the bacteria. Uh, a bit more on, on the structure, the buildup of the subunits. So these are formed of pseudo repeats. So in the, in the case of E. coli, Salmonella, and many other proteobacteria, these are five repeats. Uh, repeats of 20 to 22 amino acids with this signature alternating residues uh, in the signature sequence here. You can predict that these will form two beta strands with a linker region in between and probably another linker region uh, here as well. So this is the case in, in, in E. coli, uh, which has been, I mean, the, the major pathways that have been looked at E. coli and Salmonella for a long time. Now, if you look in bacterial chromosomes, uh, 
five repeats is certainly not the, the limit. We can see many more, so we can see multiple tens of these repeats. Uh, the repeat structure is conserved, or at least pseudo repeat structure is conserved, as you can see in this uh, uh, diagram uh, here. And again, you can predict two beta strands. Then based on, on de novo prediction, but also statistical coupling analysis and some solid states uh, data, uh, the structure that has been proposed or predicted is that of a beta solenoid for an individual subunit. There's a model that you can see here for E. coli, CSGA, and then likely the fiber or the thinking is that the fiber is a stacking of these beta solenoids along the long axis uh, of the fibers. And then you have these conserved residues uh, that are on the, in the core of the, of the beta solenoid. So what we wanted to do is to have experimental view on the structural buildup of the native fiber and also start to get insight into the aggregation pathway. So here, what you see is negative stain images of fibers which are harvested from biofilms, E. coli biofilms. So these are ex situ fibers. Uh, and, and in addition to individual fibers, individual fibrils that you can see here, which we have uh, a diameter of four nanometer, you can see that these fibers are also highly aggregated. So for, I mean, this is, uh, is proving a bottleneck in, in looking in, in trying to get a 3D structure uh, or ultra structure of these fibers starting from biological material uh, is that we have this aggregation and uh, in, into very different oligomers and, and, uh, from the fibrils. Nevertheless, we, we can have uh, already some insight from the ex vivo fiber. So this is now cryo uh, TEM images and the first number of 2D classes uh, where we can start to discern some secondary structure. And so in some of these classes, what you can see is single fibers in, in what is probably a side view of the beta solenoid. We can see secondary structure, which has the hallmark of the stacking or the step size from stacked uh, beta strands uh, here seen along the long axis of the strand uh, here. But what is also apparent is that because we have this mixture of, of multi-fibers uh, in addition to single fibrils is that we don't have pure classes and that we will not get to 3D structure from, from this, at least from this sort of uh, preps. So in parallel to the ex vivo uh, fibers, we're also looking at in vitro fibers, both in E. coli, but we're also resorting to, to, to uh, CSGA homologs from, from other bacteria. And one uh, homolog that we're now working on that we're calling R17 is allowing us, so these are in vitro fibers that we're looking at here with negative stain on the left, and under certain conditions, we, we are able to now get individual fibers which are dispersed and, and are then an easier target to, to obtain uh, a structure of. This is a cryo yam image where you can see both individual fibers still as well as lateral stacking uh, of these fibers. But we can get individual fibers. And then from these fibers, now we start to get cleaner 2D classes and we start to get additional structural insights uh, in, in these. So what you can see again is single fibers with this stacking of beta strands seen here along the long axis. We can see double fibers inside view and we can see fibers, uh, double or single fibers in front view. And so this seems to be confirming the model of a beta solenoid uh, here seen in front view uh, or here seen in side view and the beta solenoid, so the packing of these beta strands along the long axis. Unfortunately, for the moment, this is as far as we are. So whilst it confirms the models, uh, the up initial models, uh, uh, we don't have a 3D structure yet. And that's because we are uh, plagued with preferential orientation. We have just these front views or these side views. And unlike most other amyloid structures uh, that are out there, uh, we have very little or no helical twist. So we, if there is a helical twist, it has a very long pitch, too long for us to see crossover demands and see additional orientations for the 3D reconstructions. So this is where we are for the moment in terms of trying to get to a, a structure of the native state, the, the end state of the, of the curly uh, here. I'm just gonna conclude that part with showing an ab initio model. So this is the R, R17 uh, ab initio model as, as generated by, by Robetta. 
what 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 is I mean that does still show a helical twist. What we found remarkable is if you do a, a molecular dynamics uh, relaxation, that this, in, this indeed seem to lose the helical twist, and that we have this purely uh, translational stacking of this beta solenoid with these fibers. So this may be indeed the case what we see in the EM as well. So in the next few slides, I mean, I've, I've been talking about our efforts and, and our progress in terms of getting a structure of, of the end state, the native fiber. We're also interested in the process itself of, you know, the nucleation uh, aspect, because this nucleation perspective and, 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 and certainly in, in pathological amyloids, this goes through an aggregation process and in these, these oligomers is now where a lot of the cytotoxicity is attributed to. Uh, so, so we're interested to seeing what the what the aggregation uh, pathway is for for this native uh, amyloids uh, as well. And so, for that, I mean, this is uh, we have a number of bulk uh, solution techniques that have been broadly used in the amyloid field. One is is the staining with THT, so uh, thioflavin T. Uh, fluorescence as it binds the amyloid scaffold. We can follow fiber formation by dynamic light scattering, and we can follow the occurrence or the loss of, of secondary structure by circular dichroism over time. But these are all uh, bulk uh, solution technologies where we are, I mean, where we have to model what happens at the single molecule or single fiber uh, level. So what we really wanted to do is to have the technology where we can observe that uh, directly. So this is just showing that I mean, in, in, in vitro, very rapidly we will have plenty of nuclei and then over time we will aggregate. But what we really wanted to do is to have a technology where we can look at single fiber level uh, at, these, uh, at these early phenomena, at these growth and nucleation phenomena. And one such technology is, is atomic force microscopy. So here you see both ex situ fibers. So these are fibers isolated from, from a biofilm um, uh, in, in the atomic force microscope or fibers that we grow inside the atomic force microscope on the surface of the mica. So starting from unfolded CH2A. Uh, and, and these are, again, from as much as we can see, are isomorphous with, with, with the ex vivo uh, fibers or ex situ fibers that we can uh, image. And what is great about atomic force microscopy is that you have good time resolution. So if you, if with, with fast scanning, you can have a dynamic view of the process here. So what you're looking at here is, is high-speed atomic force microscopy, starting from unfolded CSGA, we dissolve, and then we watch the, the formation and, and, and the, the birth, the nucleation of new fibers on the surface of, of, of the mica here. <clears throat> And so to, to describe this phenomenon, what we do is we form these chymograms, uh, so chymographs. So what you do is you, you take the, the ultimate uh, length of the fiber, and then you plot the density along the trajectory of the fiber over time. So this is the length of the fiber in, in A, in the Y dimension, X dimension is the, the time uh, here. And then you can see nucleation phenomena, and you can see both the extension of the fibers. And what is immediately apparent is that fibers are polar. So we have a fast uh, growing uh, pole and we have a slow growing uh, pole. Uh, what we can also see is that on the, on the mica, the fibers show a curvature, which is also what you see on the surface of bacteria. So this is retained. This, this, this growth kinetics are independent on the orientation on, on the mica. This polarity is intrinsic in the fibers. So if we fragment uh, the fibers with the, with the AFM tip, we can see that the extension retains the orientation. So the fast pole and the slow pole is intrinsic to the, to, to, to the structure. Um, another phenomenon that we see is that of the stop and burst uh, dynamics in the extension. So we have periods of stagnation and then we have bursts where you have multiple subunits coming in and then again stagnation. So there, there, this is either a structural uh, poisoning at, at the growth end, which is temporarily not amenable to new fibers coming in, or it means that during burst, multiple fibers are coming in in, in, in trains. And this is something that, that we have yet to find out what, what is exactly uh, the case there. 
What is also interesting and, and maybe what I want to pay most attention to in, 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 the, in the coming slides is that we can follow uh, nucleation phenomena. So we can, we can follow the emergence of a nascent uh, fiber here. Uh, and so you can see that in this time series here where we go from an empty site to the first species that we can discern with the atomic fire microscopy. And what is amazing is that within the time resolution that we have, we can see at this species, uh, which is extending with the same kinetics as mature fibers do. So there is no incubation period uh, where this fiber needs to find a, a conformation that is amenable to templating extension. Uh, this, is, this looks to be an instantaneous process. So we go from a minimal species that we can see that looks morphologically uh, the same, uh, at least at the resolution that you have with atomic force microscopy to mature fibers. And then the extension kinetics are immediately that of mature fibers as well. And this is very different to what is seen in most so-called pathological amyloids, where, where, which are usually fragments or, or unfolded uh, forms or mutants of a folded protein. Uh, and what is often seen is that you first have aggregates, amorphous aggregates, and that within these aggregates, this is where the amyloid nucleus or the amyloid template is found from where you then have templating and fast extension on, on this. So instead, what we seem to see in Curly is that we have a direct instantaneous nucleation and we think of it as, as monomers coming together, possibly minimally a, a dimer, and that we have these unstable uh, folding intermediates, uh, which then if they, if they collide, um, may condense into the first uh, minimal stable amyloid scaffold, which is immediately that of a mature fiber and then starts uh, extending with monomers uh, from solution, or we have coincidence folding. These are at least the theoretical uh, models that we that we have of how this nucleation is occurring in this functional amyloid. So it, it appears that this evolved amyloid, this functional amyloid, may have avoided the formation of these, these aggregates, uh, which in many uh, pathological amyloids at least are associated with toxicity because I mean, for some of them, it's shown that they are active towards biological membranes and have pore forming ability. So we seem to have a direct pathway from uh, unfolded monomers into a minimal species nucleus uh, that is then templating further extension into the mature uh, fibrils. So to further expand on these first observations, uh, which we published now a few uh, years ago, we also, I mean, we, we, one thing we did is to look at the process using NMR. <clears throat> so here we're looking at the unfolded monomers and then looking both over time what happens with the disappearance of the unfolded monomers. Uh, and we look at the residual structure or the, the level of structural secondary structure that is present in these monomers. And so what we see is that uh, monomers are largely intrinsically unfolded. So they're, they're unfolded with some local alpha and beta structure, but it's really uh, localized uh, in, in, in minor, uh, minor parts. And then we see never a buildup of a folded species over the time, uh, but we see gradual disappearance of the signal as monomers are recruited into the fibers. That's what you see in these plots uh, here. Um, so, Another technology uh, that is great to looking at these phenomenon at the single molecule level or small oligomer level is that is, is, is native mass spectrometry. And this is something that we're doing together with Chloe uh, Marcus. So here we're again looking at starting from unfolded CSGA we desalt, and then we're looking at early events in the native, I mean, in the mass spectrometer. And what we can see is in, in a, I mean, of course we can see monomeric uh, CSGA, but in addition, at least in the first hour, we can see these species, we can see uh, the presence of, of a dimeric species. And in the native mass spectrometer, you can also increase the energy uh, that you have in, in the ion mobility uh, trap. And we can see that in, in the monomer, there is a more condensed state with which is an energy sensitive uh, to then go to probably the fully relaxed uh, state uh, here at, at higher collision energies, 
in the case of the dimer, what we see is we have a dimeric species, which is more stable, uh, which, which takes higher collision voltage, and that but at higher, in, at, at extremely higher collision energy, this uh, transits into a more bulky species, which is lower migrating, so probably partially unfolding, possibly of the extremities of this dimeric, dimeric species. So and then uh, final uh, set of slides on, on this, this nucleation aspect of Curly is that we're also now to able to start seeing uh, these species uh, in electron microscopy. And that's because we can use some of these larger uh, CSGA homologs. I mean, E. coli CSGA would be too small to see in the electron microscope, but if we resort to these larger uh, homologs, uh, there is a possibility that we see these monomeric species or these, these minimal species. And that's what you see here. So I've highlighted here a number of them. And these are uh, 2D classes of the small number that we have. But what we can see is dimeric species and possibly a folded uh, monomer uh, here, uh, which starting to show the secondary structure of the beta solenoid that we also see in, in the mature uh, fiber. So that seems to, I mean, these additional data seem to confirm what we were already proposing based on the atomic force microscopy is that, I mean, uh, this curly, this evolved amyloid behaves as an IDP with, with, I mean, sampling partially folded state, but is an unfolded protein. That nucleation is, is, is well, minimally dimer, possibly the monomer, if the monomer can fold, but that's then very short lived. We don't really see that, we see dimers. Uh, and, and that from the dimer, these already have structural aspects from the mature fiber and have the same extension kinetics as mature uh, fibers. And this may be a way to evolve aggregates where uh, toxicity can, can occur, as we know from pathological uh, amyloids. So if, if, if I still can take the time, I would like to now switch to the second part of the talk, which is to very briefly talk about this uh, transporter, CSGG, or, or, or transport channel, uh, at least, and then a bit more on its application in sensing technology. So as I said, I mean, what, what drove us, or what, what lured us into the project was really to try and answer this question here. What was the driving energy for this process of this translocation process? I'm not going to dwell too much on that. I mean, this is something that we published, or at least the ideas of how this works. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to introduce the structure. So CSGG is a lipoprotein that oligomerizes in nine copies into this, uh, in, into this channel. It's a constitutively open channel, uh, which is a minimal to unfold the chain translocating the channel and so the big question is how do you drive uh, diffusion how do you rectify diffusion these brownian steps as a, a a long chain like the csga is slipping through this uh, through this pore and we think it's anthropically driven but i'm not going to dwell too much on that i'm welcome to to elaborate if there's questions but for now today i won't dwell on, on that what i would like to spend a few minutes on is work from uh, a recently graduated PhD student, Sander van der Verre. And the question that Sander was, uh, was addressing is, is that of secretion and then at the surface, the coordination of secretion and assembly into, into fibers. So I already mentioned in the introduction, if you, if you remove CSGB, this minor component, then you do not have fibers forming in the surface. Monomers will just float away from the cell. The same is true if you remove this accessory protein to the translocation channel, which is called CSGF. CSGF forms a stable complex with G, but if you remove CSGF, again, you will not have surface localized fibers. So B and F are interacting with one another and are also genetically uh, uh, interacting with one another in that they are both required to nucleate the uh, formation of fibers at the cell surface. So what Sander did is that, I mean, on the one hand, trying to use tomography to see if we can see the secretion channel inside the periplasm and we, and we see if we can see contact points of growing fibers on the surface. We have not managed that. I mean, this is something that has been done in many of the other um, 
secretion systems in gram negatives. So, I mean, we've been trying to do that, but we've not seen the secretion system here, or we've not seen attached fibers. Um, and in addition, someone has been looking at the structure of the CFGG, CFGF complex. So this translocation channel and the assembly adapter, let's say, on the extracellular part of, of the machinery. So this is a low resolution uh, 3D model first to, to show you the two main components. So in yellow, this is CFGG, that's the crystal structure that I showed you before. And then the new structure is CFGF, so it binds inside the beta barrel of the channel, and it has this I mean, three regions that we call it, it, it's forming constriction inside an additional constriction, so a narrow point inside the channel. It has this so called neck region, and it has a globular region that we call head region. This is then the final structure here. So, this is at 2.4 angstrom resolution. Unfortunately, we only see the, the pore and the contact zone, so this, this constriction of CSGF at high resolution. If we go to the to the external membranous part, to this head domain, this is flexible, and we only have really low resolution reconstruction. So, but, but this must serve as an assembly platform where the adapter, the nucleator, is binding, and from where fibers are, are growing. This is still work in process, so I'm not going to say too much on the biological aspects of this core here. But I want to spend the last uh, five minutes or so. Uh, talking on what is probably the most significant outcome of, of Sanders' work looking at this complex, and that's its implications on nanopore sensing. So let me first start introducing nanopore sensing. So as said, CSGG forms a channel in, in the outer membrane. If you have protein channels, if you have individual protein channels in an electrically isolating uh, membrane, as ions are passing through these channels, you can follow uh, the flux of ions through these channels as an electrical current. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is an individual CFGG uh, channel in a membrane, and you can see a stable current. Uh, and then we're actually adding one of the partners in the pathway, CFGG, and you can see that the, the channel shuts as the partner is binding. So this is if you're looking at individual pores, if there's molecules interacting with these pores, in binding inside the panel or on, on a channel or on the vicinity of the channel, they will modulate the flux of ions. So, so they, will, they will modulate the conductance levels of these pores. So you can, you can use that to learn about the pore, but you can also use that to learn on the chemical aspects, size aspects, folded nature and whatnot of the analyte that is interacting with, with the channel. And that's a field that is called nanopore, uh, nanopore sensing. One of the applications of nanopore sensing, it's, it's been I a mean, long time uh, proposed by, by several groups that if with nanopore sensing, if you're able to thread the DNA strand, the single DNA strands as the bases are passing through the pore, perhaps you can use that to directly read sequence of the passing strands. And, and many people, both uh, in an academic effort as well as a company, Oxford Nanopore Technology, uh, has contributed into making this a reality. So today, Oxford Nanopore has devices, hand small devices on the market that use this principle. So you have a channel in, in an insulated membrane, you also need a motor protein, and then you have single strands of uh, either DNA or RNA passing through the spore. And as these strands are zipping through the pore, you can you, you have a modulation of the electrical signal that can be deconvoluted into sequence, and you can have almost real-time sequencing and also long read sequencing because you have you can have very long uh, strands going through the through the pore. The pore that you use matters. There's a number of pores that have been used. The pore matters and, and determines, at least in part, the, the, the signal that you get and, and the resolution that you get uh, in, in reading the sequence. Since 2016, uh, Oxford Nanopore has resorted to using a mutant of CSGG, so the, 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 the curly translocation channel, and we've been collaborating with Oxford Nanopore in improving these, these pores. And that's because CSGG or the structural buildup of CSGG is 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 ideal uh, in compared to other pores that have been used 
in terms of discerning in uh, bases and, and the different chemistry of, of, of the bases of nucleic, uh, nucleic acids. Now, one problem with so a dominant contribution in the signal comes from these so called restrictions of narrow points. So, this is the most narrow point, and this is where you have a dominant contribution as molecules are passing through the pore. And this is also true if you're reading uh, DNA. Now, the problem, uh, or, or one problem that comes from that, while having a very narrow and discrete pore gives you a high resolving power in, in discriminating different bases. It also gives a problem, or it, it turns out that if you have multiple copies of the same nucleotide passing by, so if you have a, a homopolymer region, that there the signal is silent. You know, if, if you, you have the height of the constriction, as you have multiple copies of the same nucleotide passing through, you have no subconductance levels, which you can see in this conductance trace of CSGG R9, which is the uh, uh, which is the mutant form uh, used by Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and so because of that, what what is seen is that uh, as the length of the homopolymer region uh, increases, the the, the uh, proportion of of single reads that are called correctly, so the number of of nucleotides in this homopolymer region starts to uh, decrease very rapidly from four or five nucleotides uh, onwards in, in, in the classical system. And that has to do with the height of the, of the constriction here. So I, I, I briefly mentioned to you that FCP, part of, of, of CSGF, is binding inside the channel and is forming this additional constriction. So in, in addition to the constriction formed by CSGG, the channel itself, we now have a second constriction at a fixed height of the, of the primary constriction. And so what we did together with, with Oxford Nanopore in collaboration is to see if we have this dual constriction, if we have this stacked constrictions, what does that do to the read signal? And what we can see is, is as you would predict, is that uh, you have now subconductance levels in these homopolymer regions. And here you can see what it does during sequencing as well. So here we're looking at a poly T stretch uh, and the number of T's here. And so whereas a single uh, constriction pore uh, starts to really uh, call it wrong uh, at the single read level from five, six uh, nucleotides onwards, this dual constriction will carry on much longer and, and up to nine uh, or ten nucleotides will still be mostly called correct at the single molecule level and it's even better if you have consensus uh, accuracy so although at single molecule level this th this pore will, will start to make errors in calling the length of this region uh, at i mean you can still have good read accuracy if you're looking at consensus accuracy uh, but but you, you can really expand that if you are going to a dual constriction uh, pore. And that concept of a dual constriction pore is now feeding into the into the second or, or the in the new generation pores that Oxford Nanopore is using in, in their devices. So with that, I'll I'll end with this concluding uh, slide here. Um, so I've, I've not told you much about the transport, but this is a big question in, in the lab. I've, I've been mostly telling you uh, on our efforts in, in, in looking at the curly, I mean, the, 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 the fiber itself, the native state, and the assembly process as well. What we see is that growth is polar. What we see is that we have instantaneous direct nucleation pathway, and we believe that this may be an adaptation in avoiding uh, the buildup of potentially cytotoxic species, these, these oligomers. Um, and I've been also at the end telling you about biotech application of, of, of the channel uh, coming out of this pathway. So with that, I'll uh, bring up this uh, acknowledgement slide with the many people in the lab over the years that have contributed to it. CSGG uh, structure, first structure is done by uh, Parveen Goyal. Um, CSGA, a lot of the work has been done by Mike Sleutel, uh, with also uh, Joe Claridge, Raja Bandu Pradam, uh, Sander van der Verde uh, did the structure of CSGG, CSGF, 
uh, uh, with, I mean, Nani van Gerwe did a lot in the biological aspects. Um, something I've not told you about is that the system has its own inhibitor inside there as well. Uh, Imke van der Broek has worked on that. This inhibitor is called CHGC. And then we've collaborated with multiple groups uh, for electrophysiology, for uh, initially our electron microscopy as well, native mass spectrometry, uh, and then funders uh, here. So thank you. Thank you, Ham, for this uh, fascinating story. My proposal would be that we go through the questions uh, uh, first before we give the floor to Andre. So, and I received one question, and this is a, a question from Jelle Hendricks, in fact, from Hafsuls. Ham, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. So the question I had when you presented the results of Chloe on native mass spec on, on this uh, curly protein is, have you considered using single molecule FRET to at least support this data? Because I think that maybe it should be possible to, in a maybe not so difficult way, to actually prove that particular secondary structures are indeed being formed at the early stages and even maybe at the long, at the later stages. If you include sparsely labeled, uh, double labeled molecules into your growing fibers in excess of unlabeled, I think this might even be work for, uh, for your polymers. Yeah, well, we're certainly uh, aware of the technology and, and we've thought of it. We've not ventured into it yet, but I would be very happy to do so and I'm very happy to talk with you to, to see. And yes, I would be very things. interested also. Uh, yeah. So if you if you think that it's worth trying, then we can certainly uh, see what's possible. Yes, and I mean, another aspect that we're really interested in is not just in the fiber in vitro, but the fiber on CSGGF, and so there as well, single molecule FRET would okay. be able to tell a lot. I mean, I, I haven't had much time, but I mean, you, you saw from the structure that this head, this platform there is not well resolved. We, what we can actually see is that it seems to be breathing. It seems to open and close. We would really like to see whether that's, well, it's just, I mean, whether that happens at, at, at a single molecule level and, and, mm -hmm. and what the frequency of this yeah. is and how it's modulated if, if, if the nucleator binds and additional proteins bind. So I would very happy to do so, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. We have another question from Yaif, uh, Rajiv sorry, Singh. Can we use AFM images for 3D reconstructions? The AFM images are, are too low in, in resolution. So I, I mean, I think the, the images, the 2D classes that you saw from, from the CryEM show you that we can have high resolution information. The, the problem that we have for the moment is the preferential orientation. I mean, we, we, we do think there's ways to break it and we're working on that to, to, to have the additional uh, observation angles. And when we do, we will be able to have a, a 3D structure. So that's work in progress really. There's a last question from Frank Sobot. I will give him the floor. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes Frank. Excellent, hi, happy new year. Very nice talk. Um, I was interested in um, any opportunity we might have to control the fibrillation, maybe the speed, or can we inhibit it with small molecules? Does it depend on ionic strength? What do we know about that? Well, we, we can inhibit it. There is a, a biological inhibitor in the system. So a protein I've not talked about today is called CSGC. Uh, so CSGC is a periplasmic protein. And what you can see, it will inhibit the fiber formation at substoichiometric concentration. So one in 500 or, or even smaller will still inhibit fiber extension. And with the atomic force microscopy, we started looking at that. And the, I mean, what the data is telling us is that it acts as, a, I mean, it's shielding the, the, the extremity of the, of the fiber so that it acts there as a block on the template mm -hmm. uh, of okay. the fiber extremity. Thank you. Cedric, I give you the floor now. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, hey, and thanks for a very Thank nice you. talk. Can you comment a little bit on the uh, directionality of the fiber growth, which is extremely polarized? And no, 
uh, well, I mean, I can comment on it. It's very strong indeed uh, and, and, and very clear and something we, we always have. Can I comment on it in terms, do I understand it? Uh, what, why this is? No, really not. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, so I, have you looked into, because this really reminds me, but I can't really recall exactly the details on how the, um, because apparently this seems to be linked to the biological function of it, right? I mean, this, you could imagine that these fibers go in one direction and link to the biological function. And so the question is, if you looked into the other biological amyloids of microbes that were discovered quite many years ago in the fungi, so in the, the yeast amyloids, and do they also, I can't remember if they also have these, these type of polarities. This has also been measured with AFM, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about this. I mean, does it, is it important for the biological system? It may very well be. I mean, one big question that we have an answer to is, is where is, does the extension occur? Does it occur at the distal end or does it occur in the proximal end inside the channel? This is really, an, an, I mean, one question that I would like really to answer, uh, which is an unknown in the, in the so, field. So you, you don't, yeah, you don't know how it assembled locally mm -hmm. and, and how that relates to the AFM uh, images no so you i mean you could think of feeding from the bottom and and, and growing proximal like it's done in in, in pili um, or you just release in the environment and then the subunits find their way to the extremity which is which is the prevailing model uh, but that's not really based on on experimental data that's, they, that's they had done they had done some experiments like that on the on the yeast i mean it's where they use decoration at some point so they could they could actually decorate the fibers at some point and you could see if it decorate from the end or the bottom but i can't i can't remember how that worked yeah i mean and it's been really nicely done with fluorescence microscopy in the case of flagella for example where if you different times you give different labels uh, monomers you can really see the stages so that's something that we're we're trying to set up but we don't have an answer I mean it, it's not by necessity feeding from the bottom because if you remove F or B in one strain and you co-streak it with another strain fibers will be secreted from the surface and can find their way onto the other bacteria which just have the nucleator and then grow. So, I mean, extension from the extremity is possible, just mm -hmm. like it is in vitro, but in, in biology, it is also possible. But what is the physiological way? Uh, we're not sure. All right, thanks. Yes, so the last question comes from Vadivel Prabahar, and I will give him the floor now. Uh, hi, uh, that's a very nice talk. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, did you come across any natural peptide or any other protein that can cap the fibril formation? So say again, if I get your question, can we come across a synthetic peptide that can cap the structure? Was, was that your question? Oh, natural peptide or from the same organism or from other organism? Yeah, so the natural peptide is called CHGC. It's a, it's a protein uh, and that will cap the structure so that you find in the periplasm and so what it I mean that looks like it is a safeguard for if you do have off pathway uh, nucleation in the periplasm so if, if if you would have a mutant or a temporary obstruction in the channel you you will have a, a buildup of monomers in the periplasm and this becomes toxic probably because you're starting to farm fibers in the periplasm and the system has this CSGC which acts as a uh, as an inhibitor uh, and so it, it I mean from based on our data what we believe is that it acts as an inhibitor by capping the extremity of the fibers and so stopping the extension of the of the fiber okay 93 people made it to the end home. So I think you have 93 new fans uh, for the fantastic research you're doing. Uh, in the name of all these people, I would like to thank you. Uh, and uh, I will give the floor now to André, André Matanya, uh, who I introduced already initially. And uh, to keep it simple, I will not show these slides again, but uh, I propose, André, that you uh, share your slides now and, and give your seminar. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Jan. So 
My presentation concerns an automated uh, procedure that we developed here at Robotain for the formulation of proteins. But before I really start with that, I saw that a short introduction of uh, the facility would be useful. So we are a platform mainly dedicated to the, the production and the characterization of proteins. Uh, essentially based on uh, high throughput methods. And we are open to research centers and private companies. So we are happy to work either on a collaborative or on a service basis, which is well in the spirit of Instruct Eric. So at least on that respect, it makes sense to have us on board. The Robotin facility is actually split on two different sides. One is based at the University of Liège, where I am, and the other one is at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. And there in Brussels, my colleague and friend, Eric Gormartic, is in charge of uh, the facility. So in Liège, the facility is part of this research unit, the Center for Protein Engineering that Jan uh, mentioned at the beginning. And this is really in a nutshell what we have as equipment and what we do. So in Liège, we are equipped with two liquid handling workstations that we use basically for you know, pipetting uh, liquid uh, solutions and to prepare uh, numerous samples. We have two very classic microplate readers for absorbance and fluorescence measurements. We have uh, LabShip GX2 equipment which is uh, actually electrophoretic, uh, ele capillary electrophoresis. So this is by Perkin and Mer. This is for the automated separation of proteins, but also uh, nucleic acids uh, on a small uh, microfluidic chip. Then we have a noctet HTX. So this is for high throughput equipment, which measure uh, biomolecular interactions on the basis of biolayer interferometry measurements. And this is what they have in Brussels. They also have a liquid handling workstation and a protein spotter which they, which they combine with an infrared image. And so over the last few years, we've developed a series of protocols that are listed here. Using one of the robotic workstation, which is in actually in a sterile environment, we can do high throughput cloning, mutagenesis, colony picking, and also protein expression. This is done essentially in bacteria and in yeast. We also developed uh, purification uh, protocols for small scale, small scale purification. We do purity analysis and quality control of proteins. We are developing uh, protocols for optimization of the or improvement of the refolding of proteins from inclusion bodies. Formulation, that's the topic of today. We have also uh, developed protocols for uh, automated enzymatic and stability assays. With the octet machine, we do biomolecular interactions. We can monitor the, the, the kinetics of association and dissociation in a high throughput way as well. We can do uh, protein concentration determination with this machine. And at the ULB with the FTIR imaging microscope, they do protein secondary structure analysis. They can measure quantitatively the, the, the concentration of phosphorylation and glycosylation, and they also do quality control. So this is very sh briefly what we do. And now I will tell you about the formulation screen that we have developed. So as we all know, protein stability and actually activity is of utmost importance for the development of protein-based reagents, uh, whether it is for basic research or pharmacy, industrial or pharmaceutical applications. This uh, means therapeutics. And on this picture, we've, uh, we wanted to illustrate the, the fact that for a protein in solution, different forms uh, may be significantly populated besides the fully native, folded, and biologically active species. And these forms, which are here all partially or totally unfolded, possibly aggregated, 
these forms uh, constitute a major problem because they may lead to non-reproducible data or effects when therapeutics are concerned. They certainly uh, contribute to reduce the efficiency or the activity of the therapeutics or of the protein-based assays. And it has been really well documented that these unfolded, partially unfolded or aggregated species can also lead to adverse immunological response when they are used as therapeutics. And this morning, actually, I added this to highlight the fact that the proteins can also uh, aggregate in a native-like forms with hardly no significant or with no significant unfolding. And these aggregated species uh, are also a, a serious source of problem similar to what I described for the unfolded species. Protein formulation consists at selecting optimal solvent composition to minimize this unfolding and aggregation process and thus inactivation. And this process is very well known for being complex, time consuming, and also quite empirical, meaning that quite a large number of, uh, of uh, solvent composition of, uh, of uh, samples need to be tested. And probably for these three reasons, protein formulation is, I think, really much overlooked, especially in the academic environment. And this is why we decided to develop this formulation screen, uh, which focus on the composition or the nature, if you want to, of the chemical reagents used as buffer, the pH, and the integration of some additives. And as I will show you, we have evaluated this screen on the basis of both stability and activity measurements. So to validate the, our methodology, we selected a number of model proteins. Uh, five to 10 proteins were uh, tested into details. I'm not going to give you all the data, but I decided today to choose a single domain antibody fragment, which is also known as a VHH or a nanobody. Uh, Jan said he didn't want to talk about this, so I will talk a bit about that for him. Uh, and the reason why we choose a nanobody is that, as I guess you all know, nanobodies uh, present an ever rising interest for both diagnostic and treatment in human uh, medicine. And the nanobody that we selected here is called CAPBC210. It displays specificity for a metal orbital actamase called BC2. And the story is that this was uh, isolated 10 years ago by this, this lady, Katia Conrad, who was at the time a PhD student with Lou de Waynes, who was uh, heading the lab that is now nowadays directed by Jan Steyr. So these are the main features of the nanobody. It has a molecular mass of about 14 kD. This is a bit higher probably because of the A stack. It doesn't really matter. It works as a monomer. It displays a very high affinity uh, to the, the antigen, to the beta lactamase, three nanomolar. And also about 20 years ago, Mireille Dumoulin showed in my group that these nanobodies in general, but this one in particular, display a very high stability. So this unfold according to a simple two-state model with a change in free energy of about 50 kg per mole, which is fairly high. And it displays an apparent temperature, melting temperature close to 70 degrees. So we, among other models, we submitted this nanobody to our screen. And we focus exclusively with this on the nature of the buffer and on the pH. And this uh, figure shows you an overview of the buffer, of the buffer, sorry, that we tested with their corresponding uh, pH range. So as you can see, we used 13 different chemical reagents that we used to prepare uh, set one, so single component buffers, certain different ones. And some of these were mixed to uh, prepare two component buffers, which compose set two. So in total, we had 19 chemically different buffer solutions. And in the next slide, you can see uh, the scheme, which represents 
the automated uh, experiment setup, setup that we use to generate the 158 different conditions, 86 for set one, so single component buffer, and 72, 72 different conditions for set two, namely two component uh, buffers. So as you can see, for both set one and set two, so we prefer, sorry, we prepared in total 158 conditions on the basis of 49 buffer stock solutions. These stock solutions were uh, distributed here in three 12 well reservoir plates. So these are micro plates, but instead of having wells, we have uh, reservoirs of 20, of 20 mil each. And water is provided here in uh, 300 mil containers. And so the automated liquid handling work station would pipe it all these stock solution to prepare the 158 conditions, both for set one and set two. So with the nanobody, we focused on the stability. We evaluated the screen by measuring the stability, which is I'm going to, which is what I'm going to show you next. So for the evaluation of stability, we used we we use thermal unfolding through so-called thermal shift assay. So we use automated differential scanning fluorimetry, which is based on the use of, fl of fl fluorescent probe. For this, we use Cypro Orange. You see the principle of the method is shown here. This probe is fairly uh, quenched in a normally hydrophilic environment, but you see that upon raising the temperature, we induce unfolding of the protein, ideally in a simple two-step manner, but this is far from being a generality. And this uh, results in the unfolding of the protein results in the expo exposure of hydrophobic groups. And this promotes an enhancement of the fluorescence intensity of the cyclo range. And these data can be used to monitor unfolding. The melting curves were monitored using a classical real-time qualitative PCR equipment. You see that very low protein concentrations are needed. And from all these melting curves, we extracted the TM value. The TM is the temperature of the, at the midpoint of the, the unfolding transition. And it corresponds actually to a temperature at which the free energy of the native state and the free energy of the unfolded states are equivalent. And this analysis is based on the general observation that proteins with high TM values display greater solubility and reduced aggregation propensity. And also it is generally considered and observed that proteins with high TM value better withstand long-term storage. And also, this is not the, the, the purpose of this formulation screen, but yet it has also been reported that protein with high TM values are more prone to crystallization. And so our uh, methodology here could also be uh, an asset for the selection of optimal uh, conditions for protein crystallization towards X-ray diffraction experiments. So these are the data that we obtain with the nanobody. On the left-hand side, you can see the normalized melting curve. So you see the fluorescence has been normalized between zero and one. And these are all the melting curves that were obtained after normalization. You see immediately that the data obtained or, or the unfolding of the melt, thermal unfolding of the proteins at low pH occurs at rather low temperature, whereas the highest uh, uh, temperature for unfolding, sorry, are observed in the pH range uh, of five to seven. These data are much better illustrated on this plot, where all the TM values obtained from the analysis of these melting curves, automated analysis as well, all the TM values are shown uh, depending on the pH. And on this particular graph, we highlighted in red data obtained in phosphate. And you see that the optimal, so the highest TM value is obtained here in phosphate 50 millimolar, millimolar pH 5.7. 
For comparison, I show you here the same data, but where we have highlighted uh, data obtained with trace and bistrace as buffer, you see that around the optimal pH, clearly the, the melting temperature is lower with this buffer than with phosphate. And this is even more obvious when histidine is used as a buffer. These are data obtained with histidine. You see that around the maximum, there is a decrease in the TM value from when going from phosphate to histidine. So clearly, sorry, clearly for the stabilization of the protein, phosphate is the best buffer that we tested. Now we measured the effect, we evaluated the effect of the screen on the activity of the nanobody. This was done using this machine, which I mentioned already. This is the Octet HCA workstation, which measure biolayer interferometry and which allows to monitor the kinetics of association and dissociation. And this is just to show you the, the, the robotic workstation that we use to pipette all the liquids and prepare the microplate for the analysis in the octet. So the principle of the analysis is uh, uh, schematically shown here. So in this machine, we use biosensors, which look like this. And at the tip, the tip of the biocenter, which is uh, 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 increasing size here, the tip of the biosensor is chemically activated. And in our case, we use, in this case, we use streptavid encoded sensors. So we biotinylated the antigens, namely the metallobicaractanase, so that in a first instance, we can attach the antigen onto the tip of the biosensor. This can be controlled by measuring the, the signal uh, uh, biolayer interferometry as measured by the, the machine. So when this is all done, we can then uh, plunge all the, the, the biosensors into a microplate where the nanobody has been pre-incubated in all the tested buffer solutions. You see that the protein concentration remains quite low and we can here monitor under all the concentrate, all the, the sorry, all the conditions of the screen, we can monitor the kinetics of association. And because the association rate is directly correlated to the amount of biologically active nanobodies, we have here an, in, an information of the efficiency of binding and of the quality of the, of the protein solution. So here are all the data. These are all the association kinetics that we measure under the, 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 the buffer conditions of the screen. And this is illustrated here uh, in this plot. The binding rates have been plotted versus the pH value. So what you see immediately is that uh, below pH 5, the antibody is virtually dead. No or hardly no binding is observed. And here it's quite scattered, but the best conditions of so the for binding were obtained in Bistris uh, buffer at pH 6.9. So this is the buffer which uh, provides the, the fastest binding association rate. So now if we compare uh, thermal stability and binding kinetics data and the two optimal buffer, one for stability, the other one for activity, namely phosphate and trees, you see that where Phosphate, uh, where the maximum stability is observed, phosphate is clearly superior to bistris. There is a difference in the TM value of up to five degrees. So clearly, as a storage buffer, phosphate is the, the, the buffer of choice. Now, as long as the kinetics are observed, you see that the association rate is up to five, four times, uh, four folds higher in trees than in phosphate. It's interesting to see here that there is not only a buffer effect, but a, sorry, not only a pH effect, but also a, a chemical effect, since you see this trend is completely reverted here at pH uh, close to six, where phosphate is the best in terms of stability. You see here that association in, in mysteries is slower than at pH seven. So as an essay buffer, mysteries is probably the most favorable. So as I say, we uh, challenge our formulation screen with a number of uh, model proteins. 
And then we most more recently we used the screen, uh, which was apparently validated, to formulate this protein, Cas12. So Cas12 is a CRISPR uh, associated endonuclease. We produce this protein at our sister platform in uh, at the Center for Protein Engineering. This is Protein Factory, and. Uh, we produced this for the development of alternative detection tests for SARS-CoV-2. This was a collaboration with uh, the, the, the GIGA research unit at the University of Liège. As you can see, this protein is fairly big. It's a monomeric uh, protein, but close to 200 kD. It displays nine free system residues, and it has a rather low melting temperature. So these data suggest that it may be uh, pretty delicate to handle. So we decided to uh, possibly improve its formulation and maybe its stability. So for this, we screen for buffer of various uh, chemical nature and various pH. We looked at the stability as I showed you for the nanobody. These are the data. This is quite remarkable here because you see that uh, in the range from three to pH range from T3 to close to 10, there is not so much effect, neither of the pH nor of the buffer, but yet we could find uh, conditions which improve the TM by three degrees. This is not much, but still this is a first achievement. Then in this screen, we added, compared to the, what I show you with the nanobody, we added, uh, we integrated some additives to uh, modulate the ionic strength and various other properties, and we, we screen for the stability. So the, the various additives are shown here. We use some sugars, some salt, also EDTA, a reducing agent TCEP, arginine as an uh, anti-aggregating amino acid, and a detergent screen. And I should say also that for this uh, formulation, we used a design of experiment uh, software, which is called JMP, doesn't really matter. This software helps you to minimize the number of conditions that you want to test when you have a number of parameters to vary. So in this case, we had 14 additives, which we decided to test each at three different concentrations. And uh, the JMP the GMP analysis software uh, told us that 94 conditions were more than enough to be able to make some correlation between these 14 additives this is called to look for multiple degree effects. So with this screen, we could further increase the TM by five degrees. And so it's a total of uh, eight degrees improvement. And the outcome of the analysis with the software, it doesn't really matter what it says, but it told us that there, were, there was more room for improvement. So we decided to run a second, let's call it extended screening. And we looked again uh, for the stability. So in this case, we selected the four additives which look the more promising. We select glucose as a sugar, ammonium sulfate, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride. This may look weird, but apparently the two uh, may be important. We use four concentration, 40, 46 conditions were tested. And you see that we have, we had a further enhancement of 55 degrees. So a total enhancement of 12 degrees in the TM value. This is summarized on this slide. So we started with CAS12 uh, with a TM of about 40 degree. And you see that after the three uh, run of screening, we could increase the TM value by up to 12 degrees, which is quite significant. So to finish with sort of some conclusions, I think I've shown you that we have developed a formulation screen that is highly, if not fully automated. This comprises the generation of the buffer solution, stability and activity tests, and also the data analysis. I did not discuss too much that, but all the analysis has been automatized by uh, script written in Mathematica. This formulation screen can be completed within two days if we focus only on the buffer condition and the pH. When we include uh, 
ion extremes and it details, it can be up to four days. And you see for the complete uh, pH buffer condition, ion extreme analytic uh, screen, uh, you need is request about one mix of proteins, about half that amount when we limit ourselves to the buffer conditions and the pH. So it's not that much and it's rather short in time. This formulation screen uh, was validated with uh, more than 10 different proteins, mainly enzymes and antibody or antibody fragments. The advantage of having of working with enzymes and antibodies is that it can be fairly easy to check, not just for the stability, but for the activity. And finally, as a, I would say a general observation, which is pretty notable, but not new, we notice clearly that there is not always a good correlation between the buffers that are the most suitable for stability and those that promote activity. This I show you for the, the nanobody, but we have even uh, more striking examples. So finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who did the work. So that's mainly Ruth Kellner, who was uh, a postdoc in my group hired to, uh, to run this project, which was uh, funded by the Walloon region through a so-called Beware Fellowship that was co-funded by the EU. And we nicknamed uh, this program pro for stabs so that's uh, protein formulation for stability and Ruth designed this very nice logo. This program was a collaborative project with the company Eurogentech and there Eurogentech, which is actually next door to our lab in Liège. My uh, collaborator at, uh, in contact at Eurogentech was uh, Alexandre Di Paolo. These two ladies uh, assisted, gave assistance to Ruth when she was at Eurogentech to produce some of the model proteins we used. Romain is a PhD student in my group at the CIP and he's also uh, an assistant at the Faculty of Science. He, he was also uh, heavily in, involved in the whole process in the development of the strategy. Julie and Marilene were the two former uh, managers of the Robotin platform. And unfortunately, both have lived now. And by the way, I need to recruit a new person at, to run the platform, so if you know, Someone please put, it, put us in contact. My colleague Alain Brons, who is uh, uh, the manager of the Protein Factory platform, which is the system of protein. Alain has also been really heavily involved over the last few years in the development, well, since the beginning actually, in the development of the Robotin facility. I mentioned Eric already. And finally, last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the, the staff at the Instruct Hub, Hub, normally in Oxford, for making the network uh, efficient and also, for uh, and also recognized at an international level. And finally, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to invite you to visit uh, the web page of the Robotin platform, just Google Robotin in, in Google, yeah? And also the, the Instruct uh, page. And if you want to know anything more, drop me an email. I'd be happy to reply. And that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, André, for this uh, very nice introduction to the services that are from now on provided through Instruct to, to the Instruct community. Uh, again, everyone can apply for access through the Instruct website. I mean, following the, the standard uh, protocols uh, and the standard uh, route, uh, but you can, of course, always uh, ask questions directly to Andre as well. We have a, a few uh, questions from the audience. So the first question is from Jose Arthur Brito. Do you have, André, an alternative to Cypro Orange for membrane proteins? Well, it may exist, but we've never used that. And uh, there is a, a full collection of these dyes, and well, probably there, there would be one. Cypro Orange is uh, the, the most popular dye for this sort of analysis, but there must be more, yes. But maybe Jose can, can comment because he, and, and I give him the floor because he's especially asking for membrane proteins. So maybe there's a reason, Jose. 
Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Andrzej, thank you for the very clear, very interesting presentation. I'm asking for an alternative for the Cypro Orange because um, as far as I understand, Cypro Orange binds to the hydrophobic patches of the proteins once uh, it starts to unfold, once it starts to open. So in the membrane proteins, even if it's shielded by the detergent, you will always have hydrophobic patches exposed. So as far as I can see from the literature, Cypro Orange is not really compatible for uh, thermofluor or differential scanning fluorimetry with membrane proteins. I was just asking if your facility provides an alternative if one wants to submit a proposal with membrane proteins or membrane protein complexes. Well, we could look for an, another dye uh, together for sure, but then this uh, thermal shift assays with uh, membrane proteins, which are in detergent and so on, I, I, I'm not sure how successful it will be. This is something to try, but this would be trial at a small scale first. I have no, not much, not to say no expertise with membrane protein. And I guess uh, such a screening would be much more complicated, especially well, both in terms of stability and activity. But the dye itself is not the big issue. It's probably the whole system, which is going to be much more complicated. So the second question, in fact, comes from uh, Ray. Ray, you have the floor. Okay, thank, thanks, Jan. Uh, hi, Andre. Nice to Hi, Ray. Good to hear you. <laughs> um, could I just comment on the previous question? Because uh, there is literature from, say, Walter's group in the past on using, if there's a cysteine within a membrane protein, you can go get a, a, a fluorescent cysteine coupling dye, which will not bind to the hydrophobic regions, but will bind to the cysteine within the rest, within the membrane protein in fold. So there is a way of doing this, which has been reported. Anyway, my question is very general. It's really, how predictable do you think thermal stability measurements are of the developability, this concept of how easy it is to take a biological through to a, a full development pipeline in terms of its properties and its behavior, aggregation, et cetera. So I just wonder if you had any feel for the use of thermal stability screening as a way of assessing the thermal the developability, say, of a range of, of nanobodies or, or other types of biological drug candidate? Well, I think it's a very qualitative ap approach and it's fairly easy to implement. This is why it got uh, so popular. But I see, I really see it as a qualitative uh, method. And I don't think there is a very, you know, stringent relationship between these TM values and the actual stability of the protein. As, as a first and gross uh, approach, I think it's okay and it's going to be uh, fine in most cases. But if you want to really uh, fine tune the stability of a protein, you should probably uh, use uh, chemical unfolding methods and, and, and you know, measure the intrinsic fluorescence of the protein or CD and things like this. But this is not amenable to a high throughput method then. So it's a compromise. Okay, thank you. And I guess the formulation is obviously is applicable to formulating the products as well. I mean, I guess that's a useful application of this shift. So, thank you, Ray. Yeah, thank you. There's another question from Jose Arthur. Uh, so I give him the floor. Okay, so um, Andre, this is more like a philosophical question I, I, I have. So what do you value more when uh, doing these stability assays? Um, a, a condition that increases the thermal stability of the, of the protein, like the case that you were mentioning for, for the phosphate buffer, or a condition that uh, increases or maintains the activity even if the the TM is lower, like the case that uh, you mentioned with the Bistris uh, condition. Yeah, thank you for the question. I don't think it is so philosophical. I think it really matters what you want to do. So if you want to perform uh, basic research, if you want to uh, measure the activity of your proteins under various conditions. So you really need to focus 
on the optimal conditions for the measurement. But now if you want to formulate uh, protein reagents for, for uh, diagnostics or for as therapeutics, I guess the first, uh, the, main, the main thing is to have, is to, to, to improve long-term storage of, of, of the, the, the reagent. And anyway, if you are going to administrate a protein reagent as a, as a drug, uh, the formulation is important not for the activity, but just for to maintain the activity and, and for the long-term storage. So it really matters what you want to do. So assuming that you assuming that you want to do crystallography. A crystallography, then you, you have to focus on the on the stability, I guess. Okay. Thank but, you. But look, it's very useful to have the activity essay next to it, because if you find out that the, the conditions that are promoting activity stability are inhibiting the enzyme, for instance, and this we observe, this may be an issue for, uh, for a structural study. So I think it's really ideal to have both side to side, but then the best buffer is probably the one which is going to promote the highest TM whether it's for long-term storage or crystallization or, or these sort of things. Okay, thank you, Andre. Thank you, Ian. You're welcome. Great, last question from Steph de Graaf. Steph, I give you the floor now. Hi, Andre, she's not Steph, it's Stephen Weeks. Um, I'm actually calling in from a private company. Okay. okay. Actually interested, Andre. Thank you. What other form, you presented a buffer formulation, but I'm. Do you have any other screens for looking at uh, whether that uh, either an additive or a natural compound will uh, improve stability of a protein? I'm sort of, in a sense, looking at the ability to use your screen for a, or your hardware for looking actually at binders. Well, uh, can you see the, the, the slide at the moment? Yes. Yes. So you see the screen as it is here, where we screen for all the buffer solution. Uh, there was some some uh, there is some space left here to add some different conditions. That's one point. But in any case, if you would like to screen for specific uh, reagents or additives, we this is really modular. This is very versatile. So we can modify. We can modify uh, the, the buffer solution, stock solution that you are here at will. I mean, we impl implemented the methods. We know how to screen for stability and for activity also. It depends also of the protein. And this can be modified at will. So yeah, if you would come with particular requests, you would uh, change some of the buffers that we use for other, this would be feasible, of course. And we can introduce any additives that you you may think of. Okay, thank you. And how you do the refolding? You can look at protein refolding with this. Ah, but that's another story. This I did not describe. I, I was telling in the introduction that we are developing protocols for the optimization of refolding proteins from inclusion bodies, but this is something completely different. Be in touch. Uh, we can discuss that. Uh, okay, well, offline. this could be discussed offline. This, uh brings us to the end of this sixth uh, instruct seminars uh, from a longer series. There are, we have at least four more seminars to go. I would of course like to thank again, both Han, uh, but also Andre for very interesting lectures. And I also have to thank the people from the hub because I mean, they organized everything. This went really smoothly, uh, not only for me as a moderator, but also for the speakers. So definitely, yes. uh, thank you uh, for this uh, very well uh, prepared setup. We are still 62 uh, participants. So uh, again, this is uh, a successful series of uh, seminars that uh, we have to uh, continue, I think. And with this, I can close this seminar. Uh, meanwhile, the sun is shining here in Brussels, so uh, Not in things the are changing here yet. Uh, um, and we hope to meet you all again on, on, on coming seminars. See you soon. Bye.